I'd like for you now, if you could just segue on into the Moors, you did say something um, that I found uh, very important. You said something about numbers. We invented the numbers, but uh, the Europeans always say that the Arabs invented the, the numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. Isn't that what they say? Well, we've, Chinese, we've sure, yeah, we've heard that. But the reality of it is, is that numbers have always been around us. And when you go into the most ancient of civilizations, numbers play a very important role in the development of the civilization. And numbers are used for a lot of different things. And then mathematics becomes the manipulation of numbers. But numbers are a very spiritual essence if you understand them and if you bring them into consciousness a certain way. When we look at the Moors and we look at history, when we look at ourselves as a people, one of the things that I try to do is find, as we said about Professor Clark, giving us an understanding of the philosophical underpinnings is, how did we get here? There are three questions that I always ask that we should be able to answer. Who are we in this world? Where are we in this world? And how in the world did we get here? And if you can answer these three questions, that will cover, and there are other questions to ask, but these three questions fundamentally will get you at least to the point of consciousness. As an African people in 1999, as this is being done, August, it is important for us to understand how is it that I am standing where I am and you are where you are. How did this happen? And it makes no difference what background you are. But as an African person with Native American ancestry, I ask myself this question. And what I come to realize is that if for me to understand where I am today, I have to understand what happened in October of 1492 in the Caribbean area, this area here. But for me to understand what happened here, I've got to understand what happened in Spain, January 2nd, 1492. If I may come over to the larger piece, this is a map of Europe. This again is a relief map. I purposely have this slanted because this is a larger version of Al-Andalusia, or Spain and Portugal, but this is it on the map here. Let me see that again. Mm -hmm. This version here. This version here is this here. The Pyrenees are here, the Pyrenees are here. So the top of this right here is basically right here. And then here come the Pyrenees, and then here comes Spain, and Portugal is over here. As you can see, this is the same place. There's no reason why this should be different. Mm -hmm. But because of the nature of what happened in this part of the world, uh, there are different changes. But the language structurally is basically the same. But there are differences basically also. The, uh, to understand what happened here, January 2nd, 1492, you have to understand the Crusades. And to understand the Crusades, you have to understand the Moors. So to look at the whole thing, backtracking it, to understand who we are, where we are, and how did we get here, you have to understand the Moors. Because from 710 AD, there comes an event that changes history. Because had Africans not traveled from the northern part of Africa into Spain and Portugal, bringing with them first and foremost, they brought soap. Second of all, they brought what we today call alcohol, which, well, they called it alcohol. We today call it alcohol. Because Europe was dying at large numbers through the Black Plague or the Bubonic Plague. I didn't even tell you why they call it the Black Plague. And what the um, Moors did, what Africans did over a period of a couple of centuries was brought the remedy, the prescription, that would heal them and then set them on, the, on a path to destroy the world that came in and save them. And it's important that this make a step-by-step -step common sense and that there is no emotion tagged into what it is that I'm saying, that this be, uh, it can be passionate but not emotional. It, because there are things that I'm going to say that some people are not going to like. But it's important to say it so that we can understand the predicament that we are in today. And I encourage you, first of all, let us look at certain books that might be of great interest to you. Mm -hmm. 
The first book that I'd like to draw your attention to is the book that was edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, a brilliant book called The Golden Age of the Moor. It's a very good book. It's a very important book because what I like about uh, Dr. Van Sertema is that he brings the greatest minds together and forms essays on themes and topics. This one happens to be the Moors where he's brought a great deal of talent. And there's a lot of talent here, but there's one particular brother that I tend to quote a lot. And I want that to be understood that much of my quotations come from Dr. Jose Pimento Bay, mm -hmm. who is a brilliant brother who has brought a lot of knowledge of the Moor to us. And much of what I have studied comes out of many of the pieces that he has developed. Because before we get into other books, we really have to start with our own. Because once you're grounded in an African perspective, then whatever they say about you is understandable. Because from this book, I then would encourage you to get the book that Dr. Yosef uh, Benyikinen is always talking about by Dr. Stanley Lane Poole called The Story of the Moors in Spain. This is a very good book. This picture, by the way, is the one that stands in the Philadelphia Museum. This is the one that you may see a lot of pictures of. This is a Moor, and this, this painting was done in Spain. So this brother, if you want to really get to it, he is Spanish. Mm -hmm. Spanish in the original sense of the word. He is a descendant of the Moors. And that's what the Moors look like. I know so many brothers look like that. The next book that uh, helps you understand the vast trade and understand the underpinning of the Moors, the Moors had to have had a working knowledge of the world for them to be able to create the kind of trade that they created. You cannot be trading in materials from distant parts of the world if you've not been to those parts of the world. You can say that it was brought in, but chances are if you're dealing with it, chances are you brought them back or somehow bought them from someone, but the trade obviously was being done by the Moors. So the Moors obviously had a golden trade. They were not just a people, they were a people with a civilization and a trade in place. Mm -hmm. And it's important that once that's grounded, then you can understand why they would have done the things that they did. And then, of course, the next book that I found very interesting was a book entitled Spain, A Land Blighted by Religion by Joseph Lewis. That's another very interesting book that will give you some more information on the Moors. Now, from these four books, just in the golden age of the Moor alone, there's such a large encyclopedic uh, reference library that if you wanted more information on whatever area you wanted, you'd find it here. So these four books are a strong foundation for us understanding who the Moors were, where that word comes from, and all of the confusion in terms of Arabs. There's no such thing. Arabs don't really exist as a people. The Arab people are a combination. In fact, I don't even call them Arabs. I call them Afrabs, because the nature of being an Arab means you have to be African. Mm -hmm. Just like in terms of being Jewish, in the sense of the, the ancient word Jewish, the word Semite. There's no such thing as a Semite. I'm a Semite. African Americans are Semite. Semite means mixture. Semi meaning the mixture, the Semi. Not only that, but the word Semite is not used as a people. It's used as a language. It's a Semitic language, which meant that in this part of the world, Languages of the northern climate and languages of the southern climate came together, mixed together, and created a Semitic tongue, or a tongue, a language of mixture, all in this area here. Arabs, as we know as a people, didn't exist prior to the Prophet Muhammad. Blessings on that brother's name. They didn't exist. No one referred to Arabs prior to Muhammad. They didn't exist. There were people, but they were independent nations. Some people call them tribes. I tend to stay away from that word because of what it means, but they were independent nations. It was the um, faith system of Islam coming out of Africa that united these peoples together. Prior to that, you did not have a unity of people in this area. Coming out of Africa? Yeah, absolutely. Well, when you look at the history, what we know is that Mecca, from what we're looking at and the works of many of our scholars, that the Kaaba, uh, the, uh, Kaaba that is used as a centerpiece to Islam, that essence that they must walk around, that black essence, and I want to call it an essence because I don't want to call it out of its name, but that, that stone that they walk around, that, that huge piece that they make their hajj for, 
is believed and research shows is one of the uh, relationship temples to the Grand Lodge of Luxor. And that in fact, that used to be an astronomical observatory. And that the only thing that is left behind is this black essence that people use to revere. And that is when you make your Hajj. That's how important astronomy is. Most of the constellations and stars that we speak about are not in the Latin language, they're in the Arab language. But in the Afrab language, we have to remember what was going on in this part of the world. That in fact, it was Muhammad, the prophet, blessings on that brother's name, that had gone into Mecca and was, and was having problems with the families of Mecca. So therefore, he came back to Medina. That is why I say to anybody of Spanish background, of Hispanic background, if your name is Medina, that is not a Spanish name. That's an African name. If your name is Alvarez, anything with Al in it is not a Spanish name. That is coming out of the Al-Islam, the whole Al Alvarez, or whatever that may be. Whatever your name with the A-L is an African name. The reason why I say that is because when the Prophet returned to Medina to plan his next strategy to move into Mecca, he sent Bilal, his adopted son, to Ethiopia. And it is believed that he sent him to Ethiopia and he gathered not just the people, the Ethiopians, but he also learned the faith system because Islam as we know it did not exist in this part of the world during this time. Not only that, but Islam really as a faith system in this area developed after the Prophet's transcendence. But in this part of the world, there was a lively faith system that had mixed the Amen priesthood with the Aten priesthood. The Aten priesthood being what Judaism came out of, and the Amen priesthood is what Christianity came out of. There were groups of African in this area that decided to take the best of both, put it together, and in the mountains and ambas of Ethiopia and Sudan, they developed this great faith system that Bilal came into. He learned it, he stayed with them for years, and when the prophet called forward his son to return to go on together to Mecca to take it, Bilal brought back thousands of Ethiopians with this faith system that Muhammad then adapted. Now, I know people don't like to necessarily hear that because we create myths around people, and I'm all for that, but I'm a historian, and I'm a student of Professor Clark, and it's important to separate myth from reality. And the reality of it is, is that the Islam that we know of today is indigenous to the African continent. So it is not like Islam was brought into Africa. The reason why Islam was so accepted in Africa was because it was an African thing from the beginning. The same way with Christianity. The, way, the reason why Christianity was accepted was because Africans knew when they saw this new faith system coming back over, they said, wow, I know we taught you this, but it certainly didn't look like this when we taught it to you. It came back differently than when it had uh, come out of Africa. But all of these faith systems came directly out of this. However, they returned back into an ancient time. Contemporaries of the ancient Chemites in this part of the world, even going back beyond that, there is a piece uh, that Professor Dana Reynolds talks about, where she talks about a group of Africans in the ancient world known as the Garamantes. The Garamantes are, in fact, the ancestors to who the Moors would be, who Hannibal is, uh, or who Hannibal was, and the Africans in this area, who the Phoenicians were who the Cartadinians were, or the Cartadas peoples, all in this area here, came out of an African group known as the Garamantes. Mm -hmm. And they, they uh, were African people, African language, indigenous? Absolutely. Ab and there was no distinction between the Chemites, no distinctions from the, uh, from the Nubians, no distinction from the Monomotapan Empire. There is a cultural unity in Africa. Much of what we are experiencing today is a rewritten version of what the Western world would like us to believe. When we do our research for ourselves and we build upon our own structure what we believe, then things will change. Dr. Wade Noble says correctly, power is the ability to define someone's reality and have that person accept that reality. Mm -hmm. What they have done is that they have told us who these people are and we have accepted their definition. Mm -hmm. We have not accepted their definition. We are defining what we see through the work of our own scholars. And it's not just one person, because I'm not the kind of person or the type of teacher who depends on just one person to say it. I'm the kind of person I need to see three or four other people say it, maybe not the same way, but somewhere along the same lines. There is no question that the Moorish empires were all African, and if you wanted to see what a typical Moor looked like, go and see what 
someone from Senegal looks like, because one of the major nations of that came out of the Garamantes was known as the Zenaga. And this is something, again, that the golden age of the Moor will bring out. And the Zenaga, linguistically, are the Senegal. So if you want to see what a Moor looked like, look at a Senegalese person. And if you don't know a Senegalese person, go find a picture of a, a man by the name of Dr. Sheikh Ante Jo. Even Alex Haley's ancestors coming from this area of the world, the Senegambia, they will be what the Moors look like. Not necessarily Alex Haley, because he, of course, being an African-American, might be impacted by other cultures. We're dealing with the original cultures. Kunta Kinte was a Moor. That whole system here. This, these are the Moors in here. And it's not surprising that you would see Ghana, Mali, and Shanghai coming out in the Middle Ages, or what's so-called 1211, because you have the whole nations already here. And please don't tell me that Afrabs came here and built the University of Timbuktu in a couple of hundred years, when we already know that this knowledge taught in Timbuktu was in Africa for thousands of years before the so-called Arabs had even come out. Their northern part had come out of the mountains, of the Caucasus Mountains. So we know that this information, Timbuktu had every reason to exist long before Islam. In fact, I would dare say that it was Timbuktu and other places like that in Central and West Africa that gave birth to the whole Islamic thought mm -hmm. that then would lead to the conceptualization of the faith system. So it is indigenous to this part of the world that Islam would come. Mm -hmm. And not better or worse, it's just that's where it originated from. Okay, so you have these garamantes, mm -hmm. you have the civilizations that are growing and developing, you have the not culture all here, although they may not be what's involved up here, but you have civilizations throughout Africa. So there's no reason why it would be a surprise that they would be able to do the things that we're about to talk about. There's a great deal of intrigue, but let's go back, let's just go back to Egypt. Let's go back to Kemet, mm -hmm. and let's start with the Greeks in 332 BC that come in, and because of the way in which Cambyses in 525 and the Persians treated the Chemites, the Chemites work with Alexander to expel the Persians. The Greeks come in and set up house, but they can't exist, so in 30 BC, the Romans come in and take over. Were, were Greece ever uh, a nation state? Why do they say that Greece never became a nation state? Uh, because the same reason that um, the Arabs never had a real nation state until they were unified around a single thought. There's no way because the Greeks, the Greek city-states as they existed were in eternal warfare anyway. That's all they understood was war. And so what developed was they latched on to the comedic thought. Mm -hmm. But the comedic thought was never really theirs. So they never really had a true ownership of it. So they were never able to amass into that working unit because they never really created anything here in their homeland because much of who and what they were occurred in Egypt. Mm -hmm. That's and, right, they moved their capital. Yes, and Rome did the same thing. Mm. And here in the United States, we've got Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And we've got Cairo. All of these come directly out of these concepts. They moved their capitals here Say, and every major nation from the beginning until this very day has studied in Egypt, including Hitler. That's why he had the eagle or the bird on his hat. That's why where he got the schwat sticker from. That was an Egyptian symbol that balanced the yin and the yang, the male and the female, the law of polarity. He took that to be a symbol of this new white supremacist nation that was about to rise and take over the world. This was his balance was the Urugu balance, man with man, not realizing that the perfect union is the male and the female. But see, when you're on that white supremacist mentality, you think things that are out of, out of nature. And so this is what he was, every nation has looked to Egypt because Egypt's climate allows for things to exist for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. That's Egypt's secret, it's so dry. When you get into inner Africa, you get the rainy season, you get the monsoon, all in this area here, very difficult to preserve things over thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. But in Egypt, you have the ability that dryness of the land keeps things in place, whether it is paper, whether it is stone. You don't have the wearing away. In this day and age, although we believe that there was great floods in Egypt at one time, thousands of years ago, 
in contemporary Egypt and going back to the pharaonic period, there was an open sky. This is why you see Africans traveling north. Because as they moved away from all of these, they tested astronomical ideas, but as they traveled further north, Kemet became, or Egypt became the center point because they could see the skies better because there were no clouds, no rain. So it's like if you and I are trying to find a better way of looking at New Jersey, and we keep moving up and up, we move from Brooklyn to Manhattan, that's not a good view. We go to the Bronx and all of a sudden we have a great view. We're the same African that was in Brooklyn, same African that was in Manhattan, but because of why we were moving the way we were, we find ourselves in the Bronx. But we, we're moving because we have a specific agenda, and that was to see the skies better. Because the better we saw the skies, the better we understood the earth. The better we understood the earth, the better harvest we'd have. The better harvest, the better we would eat. The better we eat, the better we think. The better we think, the better we would develop our culture, our civilization, and our nature. So there's a direct relationship between wisdom and survival. Mm -hmm. And this information gathering and coming up through this area here, then the Romans, again, we have, and now that we have the, the map of Europe, what we have here is that coming out of all these areas here, uh, uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, all, uh, Germany, particularly Germany up in this area here, you've got these barbarian tribes coming down. And the Roman Empire talks about this. The Roman Empire talks about these northern blondes that coming down, they're dirty, they're, um, they're ill, but they're very violent. They have no culture, they are offering nothing. These Germans, these northern Germans, are the ones that come down beyond the mountains, go through all this area here, and start taking over. This is when the lighter complexions start coming, because even here, you don't have so many people who are that light complexion. So you have all these people coming across, and then finally they come down into this area. The Visigoths and Vandals are traveling west. The Ostrogoths travel east into Italy. So the Ostrogoths are who the so-called uh, Othello is doing battle with in Venice. In what period are we talking about? Well, right now we're talking about anywhere between uh, 332 and 525 AD. We're talking in the 500s now. This is when Spain is being taken over by the Visigoths. Uh, the 525s, the 530s, going even further. Beyond, give or take decades. I'm afraid of dates because of the nature of the politics of dates. But we do know it's after um, 332 AD, and we know that it is the cause of the so-called uh, fall of the Roman Empire, not only because of its own internal destruction, but because of barbarians coming through and destroying everything that are in there, that's in the line of sight. Now, and then they find themselves down here in Spain. Now point out the areas that had civilizations, you know, uh, in, in Europe at this time that had uh, buildings and culture and religion. You and really don't have too much of that. We're talking about European Dark Ages. And, and, and the Dark Ages is the ages that Europeans don't like to look at. They don't like to remember that when the Moors in 710 crossed over into Spain, 99.8% of Europe was illiterate. They had no books, didn't have anything. Because remember what's happening, the, the Roman Empire is destroying all of the comedic knowledge, first of all. The Catholic Church is destroying all sorts of documents. They're destroying the fundamental uh, civilizations in, in, in the places that they come to. How are they destroying them and why? Well, they're afraid of them. The Catholic Church is deathly afraid of a number of things that's coming out of Africa, particularly the Amen priesthood. Because, see, the Catholic Church wasn't what it was. The Catholic Church changed it with Constantine in 332 AD. He's the one that changes the whole feeling of who Christ was. But in this time, 332, he's also doing battle with other parts of the world and he's trying to consolidate the Catholic Church. He's, he's really trying to consolidate a force that will become a major force of the world. So what he does is since he knows he can't beat Christianity, he overtakes it, he usurps it, and he changes the definition of its central cult figure, Jesus to Christ. And he changes Jesus to Christ from a supernatural, extraordinary human being into a human being that is God. The African priesthood, the Orthodox Egyptian Coptic Church and the Ethiopians don't want any part of this because they know that this is not the way in which their spirituality is. So he calls a meeting. 
From the moment that the Africans move away from the Roman Empire, that's when Rome starts having problems, but people don't want to talk about that. The barbarians come down and overtake it. But what Constantine attempts to do is he moves, he sidesteps the Roman Empire into the Roman Catholic Church, and the emperor becomes pope. Therefore, the Roman Empire doesn't fall, it's sidestep, but it loses its, its state power, in a sense, because it becomes more spiritual. However, that's not enough to fight these barbarians who don't care anything about God. So they come down, and they kill off, and they destroy whatever has already been developed, which is not much, but there's just a little bit of something left over from the Roman Empire that was left over from what they learned from the Greeks, of what the Greeks learned from the ancient Camites. Mm -hmm. Now, just one thing, and, and, and I hate to interrupt, but these visit gods and uh, uh, these uh, uh, aliens that are coming down out the mouth, who are they? What are their history? Like they, are, they are basically coming out of these Germanic areas. All this area here, remember the 51st parallel that we talked about. Uh -huh. the, the, the 51st parallel being basically right here. It cuts Europe in half. When you look at it, it just cuts it right across when you look at the 51st parallel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everything north of this mm -hmm. is cut off. So you have these people coming like Hamburg and Denmark. That's why you have, the closer you get to here, the blonder, the lighter, the more blue eye you get. So those were ice people. These were ice people coming down after, I, after the ice mountains had begun to melt during a warming period mm -hmm. that began to melt the ice that had started from Greenland. And Greenland is right here. Mm -hmm. This is Iceland. This is Greenland. Greenland on this map would be more over here. Mm -hmm. But it is out of this area because this was the last place for the ice, for the ice to melt because remember, the Ice Age always started in Greenland mm -hmm. and then covered the globe coming down this way. Mm -hmm. So that as the waters and the ice receded, the further north you got was the later in the period that the ice melted. So by, by the time the ice melted up in this age, this time, these Norway, Sweden, Finland, all this area here coming down, these are all the people because they are not indigenous to this land. They've only been hiding out in the caves while it was cold. Mm -hmm. Then they start coming down. So none of them are really Germans or Poland. They, that just happened to be the land they were in prior to their coming further south. So that by the time they get down into this area, these individuals have just totally destroyed the whole conceptual framework. So then you have the whole history of what occurs at that point with people coming down and uh, the Vikings and all the rest of that. They didn't do anything. Vikings didn't have anything. Uh, and the, the, the key of it is, is that the few things that they did have probably were borrowed or stolen from lands that they had gone to. So we have in this area here, if we can move to this 500, 600 year mark, we have Visigoths and Vandals who have come down and plundered this land. They are just living and just abusing the people in this area, constantly just raiding them and stealing from them. And what happens is that word here gets to the people here that uh, in, in Morocco and in Africa, um, that Spain is a very interesting place and that it has land there. They already know this because they're there, but in 710, Tarif, T-A-R-I-F, is sent across to look at um, the prospects of going into Spain. He comes back down, and in 711, he re well, he comes back, he speaks to his general Tarif, and in 711, Tariq and groups of Africans with some Arab translators move across and take Spain. And for the next couple centuries, battles ensue where Moors are literally going across this area into France and even impacting other parts of Europe, but not in large numbers. What's interesting is that we see that by the 1200s, we see Africans coming, coming back, and again, a lot of this has to be researched. This is not written in stone. But what we find is that Al-Andalusia, or Moorish Spain, is bounded by certain things. And again, I encourage you in the Moors in Spain is where Dr. Stanley Lane Poole talks about the boundaries of what would become the African Europe. And what he looks at is he looks at what is known as the... Um, the, the, the northern boundaries, 
is what is known as the Montañas or Sierra de Guadarrama in this area right here. Going across to what is known as Coimbra. That's the northern boundaries of Al Andalusia. And then they use what is known as the Ebro River to be their northeast boundary. Mm -hmm. And they come down the coast, across all this area here, come across, and that becomes more Spain. Right there. This is more, this is Spain. All of this is what would be considered Spain, let's say. You see? Now here would be the dismantling. Aragon, Castile, Ferdinand and Isabella, they marry and then come down into Spain, come down where the Moors are. Now, why is it like this? Why would these mighty Moors travel so far through Europe and then come down and settle here? Europeans will tell you that it's because of Charles Martel, who was a relative of Charlemagne, who was a warrior, and he was quite a warrior. Charles Martel, no question, he was a, a, a fantastic warrior, there's no question. Uh, didn't have morals, but he was quite a warrior. But the key is, is that when you look at the topography, the land of Europe and Spain, you'll come to realize that here would be most natural why you would have this like that. Look at these mountains. See, this is what the relief map does. It allows you to see. Here's the river, there's the Ebro. At the same time, here are the mountains. These mountains that are in flat form, these are the mountains right here. You see? So you could see easily these are the mount, uh, this is a, a river right here. This is a valley. This was very fertile. This is where a lot of the different uh, kinds of um, the olives, the Valencia oranges are not Spanish. They came from Africa. Uh, the, all kinds of fruit and vegetables that we today think come from Spain, the olive oils and all of this, they come directly out of uh, the African impact, the Moorish impact on Spain. And so, so throughout all of this area here, you have, and you can see why the mountains, because these become boundaries. These mountains down here, these mountains are known as Sierra Morena, black mountains. All, and more, of course, Morena, more, of course, comes from the concept of black. But this is what eventually, and you can see why. There's a natural reason why this would become a very important area. And that is because this is where fruits and vegetables close. When, when you get up into this area here, this mountainous area here, all this area here, you can't grow too much here. It's very cold, very damp. When you get down out these mountains, it's beautiful. They, they describe the weather here in its greatest times as wonderful. Why, you could grow things. So actually, the reasons why Africans, they say Africans retreated. Africans did not retreat to this area. This was the area that was reminiscent of home. And who would want to live in the cold and in the mountains and in the damp? Why would you want to live in a place you can't grow the kinds of things that you can grow in here? Mm -hmm. So it's important that here and in Italy, look at the olive oil. The, everything that Spain is known for, Italy is known for. Mm -hmm. Grapes, wine, champagne, um, the Toledo, uh, Wilkinson, razors, swords, steel making, all comes out of the Moorish impact in Spain. So this area here eventually becomes the final piece for the Moors. From 710 until 1492, Africans rule this part of the world and bring civilization to this part of the world. What, what are some of the things they bring? Well, for one thing, in some of the areas that they bring, they bring hot and cold running water. They, one of the most important things that they, well, they brought a number of things, but one thing they brought was corral, where they taught Europeans how to put animals in corrals instead of having them run through their homes. That's why we have chicken parks today. Because Europeans used to have chickens running in and out of their homes. The Africans say, you don't have animals in your home. 
Animals stay outside. They, they're in a corral or they're in a chicken coop. But that's where animals belong. And so the Moors brought the concept of separating humans from animals. Mm -hmm. They uh, also brought ideas of, of building. There was actually a city in Cordova that ran for miles, lit by lights, lamps. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is some of the things. They brought all sorts of different kinds of um, technology to this part of the world where Europe, for the first time, began to eat foods that they never ate before to see people that they never saw before, to learn languages they never knew existed, but most importantly, there were pathways of the world that they learned through the Moors. Mm -hmm. The same paths that the Moors took to leave this part of the world were the same roads that the Europeans took to conquer it. Before the universities, talk about what they taught in those universities and how that impacted uh, Europe. One of the keys that they taught was that they broke knowledge up into different areas. For instance, in our schools today, when we study math in high school, we study algebra, which by the way is more. That's what the more brought, algebra, algebra. Algebra is the manipulation of numbers. Mm -hmm. They brought al algebra, and then you study geometry, and then you study trigonometry. What they brought was a sequence of knowledge that one built on the other. In other words, you can't study algebra and then trigonometry because the principles of geometry lead you to understand trigonometry. Mm -hmm. When you understand the sequence from algebra to geometry to trigonometry, it then allows you to calculate numbers, which then takes you to the differentiations of the calculuses that you study. Because mm -hmm. calculus basically means calculation, mm -hmm. but it means manipulation of numbers, which shows you the differentiation and the other kinds of things that you do in math. The Moors brought this into Europe. Every Gothic cathedral that you see is built on the premise of how Moors built the Alhambra and the other kinds of structures in Africa. Every cathedral, every choir situates itself the same way choirs in African uh, choirs would be. Um, they sat at the feet of these Moors and they learned so much information that they came up here into England and they started a university. In fact, they started two. One was Oxford and the other was Cambridge. Some of these folks- Those folk are patterned after the Moors? Absolutely, were... absolutely. In fact, um, the much of the work was studied in Arabic and then translated into another language. Uh, there were kings in Spain, the Alfonso kings, were very good at uh, translating. In fact, many of them converted to Islam just to get the information so that they could move up uh, in terms of understanding the intellectual capacity of the Moors. Every university, whether it be Salamanca, whether it be the University of Coimbra, whether it be a, a university in France, anywhere in the world, it would, have been, it would have been scholars that sat at the feet of Moors that then went to that part of the world because Europe had no schools. Oh, Europe had no schools. No, they had no school. Not only did that, but they were not literate. They could not read. There were no books. Everything that had had any sense of intellectual growth had been burned or destroyed because the Catholic Church was against knowledge. Now, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on. They had no schools. The Catholic Church was against knowledge? Yes. At, well, that's why Copernicus couldn't talk about what he had done until he was dying. Because he was afraid that if he would have dared tell the world that in fact it wasn't the earth that was the center of the, uh, of the solar system and that it was the sun, he would have been murdered. The same way when you look at the way in which you know that Greeks, the Aristotles and the Plato's and the Socrates were teaching an African wisdom is because each of them were either murdered, exiled, or beat up for teaching a foreign doctrine in Greece or by Greeks. Now, if this information was, was indigenous to Greeks, they wouldn't have been accused of teaching a foreign doctrine. Mm -hmm. So by the nature of the Greeks being against these scholars, they were against information. Well, the Catholic Church played the same role when, with Copernicus and Galileo and others who had a fixation on spirituality. Even today, if we speak of us and the role that we play in the evolution of life on Earth, there would be people who would doom my soul to hell if I were to say that God did not create Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. There are those that would have very serious problems with some of the perceptions I have of their faith system because they are so ingrained in their faith system that any information that goes against that bothers them. Well, the same was true with the Catholic Church back then. They did not want schools. They wanted two things, CC, same thing they want today, control and containment of the masses of the people. That's all they've ever wanted. So basically, the Catholic Church wanted to suffocate 
intellectual growth. So that for you to look at astronomy and to look at the sky and begin to fathom the sky, then threaten the spiritual power of the Pope. So that there, Europe, 99.8%, I'm not sure what I said, but over 99% of, not even the kings and queens could read. At the time I'm talking about here, the kings and queens of Europe lived in barns. The castles that you see, are not their castles. They did not build those castles. And for you to put an alligator or a crocodile in a moat tells you there are no alligators and crocodiles in Europe. So where did the alligators and crocodiles come from? The same way when you see a lion outside the library or you see a lion on the shield of a crusader, like Richard the Lionheart, there are no lions in England. So your even reference to the lion has to be an African thing. This is why Medunetair is so important for us to understand the Africanness of Medunetair because most of the symbols in Medunetair are indigenous to Africa. Why are people, like Professor Clark uh, always said, always told us, why are they going to come here with nothing, come here and build everything, and never even think to go back there? And build. And build back. Even if you didn't do it in your own land, but you got to do it in another land, why didn't you bring back the knowledge of your land? But you're not going to find the things they said they built if, if they were smart enough to come down and build pyramids, why didn't they build the pyramids in Europe? Why, do, why don't you see the, uh, the movement towards intellectual growth? Why is there a dark age? Mm -hmm. There is a dark age because African knowledge is snuffed out by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. The so-called Renaissance comes at the same time that the Moors are in Europe. Like, for instance, Leonardo da Vinci is 1505. You're dealing with Copernicus. You're dealing with Galileo, you're dealing with Johannes Kepler coming directly out of the Moorish impact in this part of the world. You look at so-called classical music. I start my day every day with classical music, so-called European classical music. And people say, you know, I'm surprised because out of that, I'll play a little Olatunji. And people say, you know, it's funny that you go from, from Bach and Beethoven to Olatunji. And they say, what a change. I say, there's no change at all. It's the same thing because Europe didn't have classical music. Europe didn't have music. The Moors brought music into Europe. So the piano is nothing but a harp turned sideways, encased in wood. That's why the piano is shaped just like a harp. Well, the harp is African. There are no harps in Europe. And so it's important that when we look at the things that are in Europe, we have to look at what existed in Africa and what existed in Europe prior to the Moors. As I've said before, I think that to have a Renaissance is the greatest miracle that I've ever seen. Forget the Greek miracle. I think the Renaissance is a miracle because how can you be reborn when you've never been born? For the European to say they went through a Renaissance is like saying you've been reborn, but you've never been born. Europe never had a naissance. What's a naissance? A naissance is a birth. Mm -hmm. Renaissance is a rebirth. Mm -hmm. That's a French word. Renaissance means rebirth. Well, perhaps you can tell us what would have been the culture, the lifestyle, and the economics of Europe uh, at this particular time so that uh, one can kind of get a true picture of what life in Europe was, was like? I mean, what are, we what are we talking about in, in terms of serfdom and okay. uh, that kind of stuff? Uh, how, the, uh, uh, how the Europeans actually uh, carried on a culture okay. and economy? Uh, and a religious system. Okay. From, from Spartan Rome to the Greek city-states, from the Greek city-states to the warrior Roman class, to the Visigoths and the Vandals, Europe has nothing but a succession of wars. Nothing but a succession of wars? Exactly. You see, the pharaonic period of Egypt is a timeline. And what we do in the timeline is that we can measure technological advancement according to pharaonic Egypt. Right. When you deal with Europe, the timeline, the notches that are on the European timeline are the wars. Mm -hmm. Europe has had no technological advancement. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really done the kinds of things with what they know that Africans have done. Therefore, there's nothing but constant wars. The feudal system, and see this is why, again, in looking at this honestly, Europe, in this area here, like I said before, if you were a stronger so-called lord, even when you look at what they call themselves, a lord, if you were a lord and your posse was big and you came upon a group of people that their posse wasn't that big, you could literally 
And it was within your right. It was law. Not a written law, but just law. Because remember, people couldn't write in Europe at this time. It meant that you could overtake that individual's land. You could take his wife, his daughters, everybody, and take over, and they become your slaves. And what you do is you superimpose on that land an unorganized slave system which becomes a fundamental way of life or a law that you have a right to do this. Now, when you say an unorganized slave system, explain it. I mean, there is no written law that you can actually say, this is why I can own you. This is why I can tell you. What says that you can say it is that I'll kill you. So, the bottom line is only the strong survive. Mm -hmm. And now if a stronger lord came upon that lord, they would take the land. And then pretty soon, this constant taking over of the land is, and individuals to safeguard their valuables would keep their valuables in the castle with the Lord, which became their bank. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, the Lord would give them a paper receipt telling them that they had a certain amount of valuable, and that's what became money. Mm -hmm. In their mindset, you see, Africans use practical things for money things that you could use. But paper is just a receipt. So the Lord would get your valuables and merely give you a receipt. Mm -hmm. And the reality was is he was protecting your wealth against the other people that were coming in. Mm -hmm. That was the concept of banking. And so how were the people? The people were, were mistreated. They were abused, raped, male and female. Um, they could do whatever they wanted to with whomever they wanted to and it was the strongest. And then of course the generals and the sergeants and all the people within the ranks of the Lord's um, uh, structure, they could do what they wanted to also. There was no law that protected you. That is why when the Moors came through, the great majority, including the Sephardic Jews, gave arms, told them where the Visigoths were. In fact, aided the Africans to defeat the Visigoths and the Vandals. And I needn't tell you how they conducted themselves when you just look up the word vandal, they were called vandals. And we call criminals vandals, so that's who these were. The Moors, remember now, they have disorganized slavery. The Moors have organized servitude. In other words, when you were in working force of someone that was above you, you were not a slave, you were a servant. It was not a legal system, it was a social status. Mm -hmm. You were a human being. You were allowed the right to a hearing if you had been transgressed against, even if it was by the so-called person that was over you. Mm -hmm. When the Moors came into Europe, what occurred, which we would really have a problem with later on, is that the European, the first slavery was white slavery. Talk about that. White folks sold their people to the Moors the moment they saw Moors coming. It was, of great, it was of great pride to be able to have a black face on your family shield. It was an honor for you to have a name like Moore or Morrison. Saint Maurice was the patron saint of Germany, who was, by the way, a Kemite or an Egyptian. When the Moors came over, they were literally welcomed into the community for what they brought because they brought fairness. In Al-Andalusia, if you were Jewish, you were tried by a Jewish court. If you were Christian, you were tried by a Christian court. The only people that the Moors could try were other Moors. There was a universal way that everybody could live in peace. What the Visigoths and Vandals did in terms of religion no longer existed. Uh, their, their attacks on Jews no longer occurred. This is why the people that were expelled from Spain immediately after the Moors were the Jews. Because Next to the, after the Moors, the Jews were hated the most in Spain. And there was a great relationship between the Sephardic Jews and the Moors. The Moors controlled Europe and the Sephardic Jews controlled the business. Together they ruled Spain and they ruled in peace from 710 to 1492 with skirmishes. And of course, in the 1400s, you have the beginnings of what has been our unfolding from the beginning. You have little principalities fighting each other. And one of the ones that brought down Boabdil was that he was fighting his uncle. His uncle and even his mother didn't have much. They thought that he was in cahoots with the, um, 
uh, with Ferdinand and Isabella. Didn't have, didn't have too much respect for him, and it was infighting, and the infighting led to the destruction of the Moorish Empire. And that happens everywhere. Egypt, wherever we go in the world, they do not have the powers or the number to overtake us. They, they exploit us fighting each other. And that's been their history. They don't have the power. We give them the power. In fact, the more powerful they become is the more power that we give them. Because if we really analyze them for what they really were, we would know they are not what they pretend to be. But the Moors bringing in this civilization brought in concepts of an organized servitude that Europeans took advantage of, and they took Moorish organized servitude and superimposed it over unorganized slavery. And the end result was organized slavery. That's how they were able to write into law. See, they already had the framework in place. What they needed was organization. Mm -hmm. The Moors helped organize them. They became better, and I'm talking, they traded in their own people for hundreds of years Some before like Africa. Europeans. Yes, white slavery was it. Selling particularly their daughters. They would sell them all over the world. See, we don't know this because they are so focused on us in the newspaper nowadays, it seems like we are the ones that are so perverse and de depraved. But the reality of it is, is that it began here. See, we don't have a history of this. But when you say soul slave, how do you mean literally? How literally. Do you explain how? If where they sold them to? And where did they you sold them to them? Moorish princes. And, and you know, in many families, the wives and the children reportedly were so relieved when they were sold. They were better treated by Moors as servants than they were as wives to their European husbands. Mm -hmm. Now, generally you heard that the Arabs bought whites and sold them into yes. uh, all over Europe. But what would be the difference now between Arabs and Moors? Are we talking about the same people? Well, we're talking about the same racial problem because Islam really broke along racial lines which people don't like to talk about. The reason why Islam went the way it did was because when the Prophet Muhammad was, a, was transcending, a, a, a black man inherited Islam. Mm -hmm. And the lighter complexion Eurasians who had come into Islam were very offended. And so the split was along racial lines. It was not along, uh, it was along who would inherit Islam, but it was along the lines of what culture would inherit Islam. Mm -hmm. And again, the, this is why we have to be careful. Because it's important to understand that in this part of the world, all up in here. Today we call it Israel. Mm -hmm. Yesterday it was called Palestine, but the day before it was called Canaan. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians, who are proto-Aryans mixed with Africans, traveling across this area, coming down into Israel, they murdered African Canaanites the same way Israel is treating them. It's important that when we look at the history of this, that much of of, and I'm not even going to say Islam because it's important to separate the faith from the people. Every Arab isn't a Muslim. It's important for us to know that. Arab doesn't mean a religion. It is a mixture of people. And Arab is equivalent to African American, to Puerto Rican, to Jamaican, to Haitian. What makes you what you are is the fact that you're mixed with something. That's what makes you an Arab. That's what makes you a Jew. A Jew is not a culture. A Jew is a faith system. It is a learned pattern of behavior that people learn to behave in a certain manner. The evidence that it is not a culture is that Muhammad Ali was born a Christian. He now is a Muslim. Sammy Davis Jr. was born a Christian. He became a Jew. Anything that you can change can't be culture. Culture is something that no matter what you do, you will be it no matter what. Mm -hmm. So that when you can change your religion, it's obvious that that's not your culture, that that is a learned pattern of behavior. You learn how to pray. Just like you learn how to say Christian prayers, you learn how to say Muslim prayers. You learn mm -hmm. how to say Jewish prayers. Everything has its relationship according to the learned pattern of behavior. If you could change your pattern of behavior, it cannot be culture. So as we develop this philosophical underpinning, it's important that we be grounded in a common sense approach to this. Mm -hmm. I am a Muslim. I am a Jew. Mm 
I am a Christian. And the reason why I am all of these is because I know there is a oneness of spirituality that comes out of an African reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is no, the, the, la the two things that Professor Clark always taught us, there are two things that black folk don't need. We don't need another religion and we don't need another organization. And I support that concept in that I encourage us to become grounded in whatever we are, become grounded in the Africanity of what that is. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Democrat, look at your Africanity of being a Democrat. If you are a Christian, whatever organization or religion you belong to, believe me, it started in Africa. Ground yourself in that reality and then make your reactions to how you live be a part of that living reality. But there is nothing out here. Everything that is out here is still the same thing. It's your depth perception of what you're looking at. We are looking at a perceptual world of what Europeans have superimposed over us. What we have to do as a people is to go back to our rich tradition and begin to look at the world through our eyes. What I'm looking at right now will not change in terms of its structure, but what I receive from it will change because of my depth perception of what I'm looking at. Therefore, an, an African statue becomes far more than just an African statue when I know that when the knees are bent, it means that that, mo that that statue is in motion as opposed to it being the legs being still or straight, it means that it is, in, it is standing still. It could even mean mummification. But with the African view towards that statue, it changes from a statue with bent knees to a statue that's in motion. European eye says it's bent knee. African perception says that that is a living, moving statue. Then you look at what the statue represents, and that's what is living and moving. Mm -hmm. We have to do this perception with everything that is around us, because everything that is around us we will never be able to react to as a European, because the first step is your perception of your senses, mm -hmm. but the next is the images you create. Mm -hmm. Our images are different from their images. Our senses is different from their senses. When they superimpose, it is like what Dr. Sebi says, they transplant you. It's like taking a plant from Africa and putting it in the middle of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn is a beautiful place, but that's not where that plant belongs. Mm -hmm. It belongs in Africa. The same way if you took a pine tree and put it in Uganda. A pine tree doesn't belong in Uganda. Mm -hmm. The nature of the climate creates a certain situation and the organic family comes out of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we are a transplanted people. We are a people who have been moved from our natural habitat into an unfamiliar habitat. We then act a certain way that they accuse us of being crabs in a basket. However, if you were to go back to the water where the crabs came from, you would notice they don't pull each other down. A crab in its natural surroundings acts like a crab should act. An African in his or her natural surroundings acts as an African should act. We act unnaturally because we are out of our natural environment. If we return back into our natural environment, if you go to Africa, you will not hear Africans calling their women bitch or an African equivalent to that word. You will not hear African sisters calling that man down the block under the baobab tree my nigga or a word equivalent to that kind of mindset because in natural surroundings, they are who they should be. In this surroundings, unnatural to us, we are who we should not be. In fact, in acting the way we act, we are being very natural. Mm -hmm. If we acted any differently, it would be unnatural mm -hmm. because we're in unnatural surroundings. What we have got to do is ground ourselves in our Africanity and view the world from that perspective. Mm -hmm. When we look at the role that the Moors played, we clearly can see that another piece that comes out very interesting in this piece when he talks about the different civilizations is that Western civilization prides itself on being built on Aristotle's model of democracy. Of course, they don't tell you that in Aristotle's model of democracy, 85% of the population was enslaved, but they don't talk about that. He wrote slavery into his democracy. Who really had democracy were the ruling elders and the Senate and all the rest of that nonsense. They were the ones that were equal. Everybody else in Greece were slaves, but they don't talk about this. Mm -hmm. Aristotle's model, there were a number of philosophers, African philosophers, again, you will find it in this book. Ibn Sina, who is known as Avicenna, and Ibn Rushd, uh, who I believe is known as Averroes. These two philosophers and others, but these two, if I can point out, they were the ones that introduced Aristotle to Europe. 
because Europeans couldn't read Greek. It was the African Moors with their wealth that traveled across the globe for centuries collecting ancient Sanskrit or Indian writings, Kemetic writings. And there's a book by uh, Thomas Goodwin and Rafiq Balal. It's called Egyptian Sacred Science and Al-Islam. That book itself is such a profound book. It just, what it does, it, it compares Kemetic legacy with Islam. And it will make comparisons like, for instance, with Hagar to Hathor or Hetheru. It'll make comparisons between Ma'ad in Islam, M-A apostrophe A-D, with Ma'at in Kemetic legacy. It will, it will make relationships with Netchers. Like, for instance, one thing I found out was about Rabs. Rabs in Islam are like the Netchers in ancient Egypt. They're like the Orishas. And this comes out of the African concept of the intermediary between God and humanity. The Rabs, of course, is where the word rabbi came from. Uh, rabbi itself, of course, is meant to be, you have to understand, Raba. Rabbi, Ra, Ba. Ra being the energy of the sun and Ba being the spirit of breath. The Ra, Ba was a combination of both which brought life but encapsulated in the human made you a divine person which made you Rabbi, which created the Rab. All coming out of the African tradition. This is our history. This is why I say when we look at the world through our tradition, if you're Muslim, stay Muslim. But just understand your Moorish impact. Understand that Islam came out of Africa, came out of the Moors came out of the rich tradition of Africa. And if you want to, and, and forget about what I'm saying. What I encourage you to do, go back in history and look at life at the time we're talking about here. Look at life in the East, Persia, which was Iran, Iraq, um, uh, uh, coming down uh, to Saudi Arabia. Read the book, by the way, um, at the African presence in early Asia. Read the book, The African Presence in Early Europe, again by the dynamic scholar, Dr. Ivan Franchotto, who brings essays together, which gives you a lot of perspectives towards a theme which allows you to see it much larger in his perspective. I'm sure he could edit everybody's book, but because he makes essays, he gets right to the point. So all of his books in terms of the African presence all around the world, you'll see the relationship and how the Moors had to have been what brought the Renaissance in place, because it is here that bringing the knowledge of all around the world, Sanskrit, Medunetair, ancient America, uh, going into all sorts of parts of Africa, bringing this information here, and then bringing it into Europe, developing the universities, and then it's spreading across the world. The Aristotle model of democracy was introduced by African people. So even the democracy, the conceptual democracy of Europe, because mind you, there's nothing but kings and queens in Europe. There's still kings and queens in Europe. In fact, we've lived to see the king of Spain in Europe. So there's still kings and queens. So where all of a sudden is democracy? And America, by the way, is not a true democracy. The fact that we have a president is the last throw that they just couldn't get rid of that king concept. So the president is there. If America was a true democracy, we'd be run by Congress. But because we have a president, that's the throwback to the Europeans' inability to get rid of the king. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, so the Moors uh, uh, stay in education of uh, Europe uh, at a time when Europe was uh, selling its own people in the Dark Ages, enslaved, uh, only about the women, uh, and then move on to uh, uh, the Moors being uh, uh, the Inquisition. But, but women played a, a role, uh, European women. I mean, there was a, so many of them burnt to the stake. But tie that in with sure. the church. And, uh, sure. And you know, there's one other thing that, I, that that I'd like to add about this. Another thing that the Moors brought was a sewer system. In other words, when Europeans went to the bathroom, they went right there. They might have segregated themselves into a corner of the room, but they dug a little hole and they went to the bathroom there. When the Moors got there, they said, no man, you got to run that stuff out of your house. So what they did is they started the sewer system that would run drainage through the house down into a segregated area of the community that all of the waste, all of the garbage, everything was channeled down in that area so that it was not within the compound. So think of the, 
the structure of the mind of the African, understanding, okay, you put animals in corrals and coops, you put your waste in a sewer system, you have hot and cold running water, they had air conditioning in Europe. By the way in which they built their house, they understood waves and, and the way in which the earth was structured so that, you know, there are some places in a house that you go that you might say, I always go in there because a cool breeze runs through there. Well, the reason why is that if you had studied the way in which your house, where your house was built, you would know that by the nature of your surrounding environment, a cool wind passes through a certain way. If you open up one window and a door, the wind will go at a particular time. The Moors understood this direction, and that's what air conditioning was. We're not talking about the air conditioning necessary in the kind of boxes that come out at us. That's artificial air. What they developed was a natural cool air. They would, in fact, build fans and flutters, uh, uh, shutters, so that the wind would blow the same way a sail will go, the wind would go. They would build it in the house so that you could just be in a house that was totally air conditioned. And there was, there was a number of things they could do, but I wanted to add that because this adds a fundamental thinking process, and this is what Professor Clark was so helpful to developing me, is the common sense approach to this. Because when you're dealing with someone whose life is meant to confuse you, you need someone who can set you straight. And Professor Clark's approach towards teaching gave you a philosophical underpinning. It grounded you in why you needed to know this, what you could do with what you knew, and what would happen after you knew it. As a people, we have got to get a philosophical underpinning to our nation. That philosophical underpinning should be the Moors. I encourage my brothers and sisters in Islam, whether it be the nation of Islam, whether it be the uh, Islamic movement of our brother uh, Dean Warth Muhammad, whatever Warth Dean Muhammad, apology. Whatever Muslim you are, I challenge African people to study that language and to begin to look at some of the documents and to translate them. Because you will find that many of the translations are going to be the kinds of translations that would be equivalent to the Shabaka stone. They will, they will tell certain things on a metaphoric level that we have not yet come to grips with. So I'm encouraging, there is a lot of things that we can do to make this better. But let's go back to the Christian church and let's go back to women because it's interesting that that is one of the problems that the Eurasian Islams had with the original African Muslims. And that was the treatment of women. In Al-Andalusia, Al meaning spiritual, Andar in Spanish meaning light, loose is light. So what they were saying was that Al-Andalusia, they were going to build a nation that walked in a spiritual light. That's what this nation was meant to be. And here, women were free. There are documents showing the jobs that women held equivalent to men. It shows the monies they received, the compensation they received equivalent to men. Women owned land. Women had title. The Moorish women had every right that the man had. They were leaders. They were warriors. The problem that the Eurasian um, Muslims had was that they couldn't get rid of their control and containment of their women. That was a very serious philosophical point that Muslims had, and another reason why there's such a schism within the nation, according to how the women are treated. So, and then of course the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church having almost a, um, a ne well, it, not almost, but having a totally negative feeling towards the woman, building her to be the cornerstone to the fall of man. I could never understood, I could never understand that. I could never understand a sister talking a man into doing something and a woman get punished because the man is weak. If I were God, I would have busted the man. And I would have given a lot of respect for the sister to having, for having the ability to persuade. And I would want to bring her on my side since she had the power of persuasion and the man was nothing but a follower. So even in the story itself, it blames someone, but it makes the person that's exonerated weak and it rewards the weak and it punishes the strong. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a fairy tale to me. Mm -hmm. It is a story that the Moors couldn't accept. Another problem that the Moors had with Christians and their Eurasian Muslim brothers and sisters was that the Moors didn't have faith in God. They didn't have a belief in God. They knew God existed. To have a faith system put you on that precarious tightrope that if swayed either way, 
you could lose. Africans would never have lost faith in God because they knew God existed. You only lose faith when you don't trust that something is going on. So when the Moor would present himself to God, they knew that, well, in fact, they called it adoptionism. Adoptionism was the concept of this supernatural, extraordinary human being that by the nature of his, her relationship with nature, not only knew God, but came to realize and become conscious that they were God. And they acted like God. And if you define your God to be the master and the mistress of the universe, God acts a certain way. That's how they treated each other. They said, and this is in the book by um, Stanley Lane Poole, he said that when the Moors were driven from Spain, Europe has never been the same. That if the Moors had been allowed, let's just say somehow or other, Ferdinand and Isabella, instead of attacking the Moors, had somehow of a working relationship that they decided, okay, but let's just work together. This world would be totally different. If instead of destroying the Moors, they made the Moors a major part, they would have been able to develop a civilization that today doesn't exist. Why? Because it is recorded through Dr. Van Sertema's work that after 1492 and in coming to this part of the world, that there was a bishop by the name of Landa who burnt thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Native American codices. Codices are equivalent to Egyptian uh, papyri. Papyri is the plural, codice is the plural for Native American. Codex is the singular, papyrus is the singular. So one codex is one, let's call it a book or a script. Bishop Landa, out of the Catholic philosophy, burned thousands of books that had been written by Native American peoples on health, nutrition, science of all kind, mathematics, the Maya, the Olmec, all of these civilizations that brought all this wisdom together, again, from Van, Dr. Van Sodom's work, looking at the role Africa played in this area and the coming together of these two people. Bishop Landa destroyed the works of the Native Americans in the West, while Bishop Cisneros was destroying the Moorish texts. There was a day that in Granada they took over 300,000, and again, I'm afraid of numbers because it could be much more than this, it could be less, but it could be more, texts, and they put it in the middle of the court and they put all of the texts on fire because they said they were books of the devil because they were written in Arabic and they were probably Qurans. Burn them. And today they celebrate the day of the bonfire. And that's what they're celebrating when they celebrate the day of the bonfire. This is celebrated in many Spanish-speaking countries today, but we don't know this. We don't understand our culture and our history. We celebrate the destruction of wisdom and knowledge, not realizing that it's probably why we have cancer today. Because chances are, had those texts been preserved, many important medical documents probably would have saved a lot of lives today. So the relationship that they had in terms of wisdom and knowledge is deeply in the tradition of Europe. The Catholic Church in destroying the works in the East and in the West destroyed what would bring forward civilization. And today we have their, their inability to decipher information. And so now we have nuclear fission instead of fusion. Nothing wrong with fission in its place, but fission takes a uranium atom and it splits it. And it contains these split atoms contained in a particular area. And if detonated all at one time, this fission creates a mighty explosion. What I just told you is written on a, in the Muslim text that dates back in the thousands, a thousand years ago. In other words, Africans understood the nuclear bomb. They understood the power of nuclear fission, but they also had a great respect for nuclear fusion. Fission is when you separate the nucleuses. Fusion is when you fuse them together. And this is why the study of the sun has to become priority in our life.
so that we can begin to develop the kind of civilization built on an energy level that only the sun can bring to us. The Moors were aware of this. It is in their documents. So this is not something that we're all dreaming of. This is things written. This is where those that can understand the Arabic language would be able to decipher and translate some very important documents. The uh, Catholic Church rising up through this time in the 1500s and the 1600s, you can see what's going on because look at what happens. You have the splitting of the world in half. It's called the Treaty of Tordesillas. Dr. Uh, Leonard Jeffrey says this is one of the turning points in European history. What this does, it literally cuts the world in half. Gives, gives the east to Portugal and gives the west to Spain. However, what they didn't tell you is that Christopher Columbus was a, um, a double agent for the Portuguese. Because remember, Christopher Columbus is married to Portuguese royalty. He is involved with the Portuguese long before he's ever involved with the Spanish. It is upon this mark that Brazil speaks Portuguese today was because the Treaty of Tordesillas, the line of demarcation, cut it so that the largest part of South America would go to Portugal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the West, Florida and California, Los Angeles, and all these other areas would go to the Spanish. Mm -hmm. But now you have other world powers coming on the scene, like England. And England says, well, who is this Pope that he can split the world in half and give half to Portugal and half to Spain. What about us? Germany says, what about us? France says, what about us? And so what happens is that there starts to be a war amongst the Europeans for the spoils of what the Moors introduced. And the reason why Portugal, you know, you hear this story about Prince Henry the Navigator. That, that, that's such nonsense. There are boats in the pyramids of Khufu that are larger than Prince Henry's boats of Portugal. Where did he learn how to get on the waters? He learned from the Moors. Why is Portugal and Spain the countries of Europe that are moving out of the Dark Ages first? What is it happening here that's not happening every other place? The Moors. See, this is how you can tell civilization. Why didn't they do this before 710 and 711? Why, why was it only when Africans came up that you start the literacy of Europe? You start the building of, of different buildings in Europe. You have uh, warfare in, in, on, on the level of guns going on. You have a number of different things. The foods are different. The foods are changing. Why is this happening? Why didn't it happen before? It, it's not happening before because it wasn't introduced. The Moors were not there. It was they who brought this in. These individuals get mad, and then pretty soon they go to war. Now, Prince Henry, uh, Prince Henry you know, this story comes down to us that um, he broke away from the church because of the selling and Calvin breaking away from the church, creating the Protestant m movement. It had nothing to do with the so-called, you know, uh, days of grace, uh, that giving church money would, would give you abstinence. It had to do with the fact that the only way that they could take away the power of the, the only way they could get land mm -hmm. that the Spanish and the Portuguese got was to take away the power of the Pope. Mm -hmm. Because if the Pope is not your leader, he can't tell you what is and is not yours. Mm -hmm. Therefore, England, France, Germany, all in the guise of religion, break away from the church to undermine the power of the pope so they can go to war with Spain and Portugal to take back land. And that's what begins to happen. And one of the, the next great power comes France. The great power I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. France with Napoleon. Now what brings him up? He gets into Egypt. He gets into Kemet in 1797, Napoleon III, the so-called Great Napoleon. And it is here that he brings his intelligentsia that studies Egypt and is able then to bring what we know as the modern world into place. England says there's no way we're going to let France get away with that. So England, Wellington, then goes after uh, Napoleon at Waterloo. When he beats France, the first thing he wants is Egypt. Why? Because he wants the knowledge of Egypt. And then we move into the 1900s with so-called Lord Carnarvon in Egypt, unleashing secrets, and then you have the Industrial Revolution. Not only Industrial Revolution, you have America in geometric progression going into a civilization that they themselves have absolutely no reason to be in because they don't have the back, 
background information to be there. You cannot get to the Iron Age without going through copper and bronze. You can't get to trigonometry without first going through algebra and geometry. It appears that Europe overnight has been by God given all this information. And they were given this information by God. The Moors gave them this information. And the Moors at this time in history were their gods. They won't admit it now, but this is the truth. With enough investigation, you'll find that Morocco played a very strong role in the development of the Constitution of the United States and what we today know as America. The Moroccan government had a lot to do with uh, the information that America received along with the acceptance of America as a nation. So there's an ongoing role between the Moors and America, not to mention, of course, the work that Dr. Bay is doing, uh, Dr. Jose Pimento Bay, in the relationship of the Moors and Native American peoples. It would be so obvious that if you have this great civilization going on at 710, going up to 1492, it would only be natural that between this time period, 710 AD uh, to approximately 1492, that you have the great nations of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, and that they themselves under Abu Bakari, the second, as Dr. Van Chetema says, and they came before Columbus, coming to America. There's no reason why some of those Moorish heads could not be, I, I'm sorry, the Olmec heads. There's no reason why some of them could not be Moorish heads. There's no reason why there should, could not have been Moorish civilizations in America that would have led to the darkening of the Native American uh, peoples along with the, all of the other nations of color that were embedded in America. So it is not from my perspective, unnatural that we would see such a lively relationship between Africans and the Americas and China. There's evidence of Africans bringing elephants into China. But if you're bringing elephants into China, what kind of boats must you have? What kind of technology that would allow you to bring elephants? You don't do that on no canoe. So they would have to have had high-powered wisdom. Not only that, but you have got to know that if you have a certain amount of weight, how you're going to travel on the water. So they must have had great navigational skills to know how to bring elephants from Africa to China. So all of this knowledge is here, but because they have dwarfed us and superimposed this concept of white supremacy on us, we don't know how great we were in history. So now we fight and we struggle and we go here and we go there to be accepted in a college that some of these individuals from Cambridge and Oxford came to the United States and decided that they were going to create King's College. The same people who studied at the Moors brought the information that they had developed in England that the Moors had taught them to the United States and created in New York King's College. Today we call it Columbia University. Af Columbia University's wisdom and knowledge is based in the wisdom and knowledge of African thought. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me ask you though. How, did, how were they able to defeat the Moors and what uh, kind of uh, uh, fighting and atrocities were perpetrated on the Moors? I saw you read the book. Okay. Uh, let's just look. And you see, again, we have to look at the Inquisition. And we have to understand exactly what, what it was that was going on in terms of What's the Inquisition. The Inquisition? Yeah, okay. okay. The Inquisition, more or less, is basically... Well, let me, this is a book called Spain, A Land Blighted by Religion. Please allow me to read, just so you can understand. Joseph Lewis, this is what he's saying. In my travels through Spain, I saw many buildings that were used as inquisitorial chambers. In Seville, I saw the crucifix, which hung in the building of the Inquisition, presided over by Torque Mada. Torque, T-O-R-Q-U-E-M-A-D-A. -E in Valladolid, I saw the Palace of Justice, which was afterwards used as an inquisitorial chamber where Isabella and Ferdinand were married and, uh, and under whose regime the Inquisition was started. I visited the cells and saw many of the dungeons of this building. In Madrid, I visited the public square where the officials of the church and the state assembled to celebrate the reading of the sentences of the auto da fe to the victims before being burnt at the stake. However, here in Barcelona, is the only building that I found in Spain that bears the official seal of the Inquisition. In this building, helpless men and women whose only crime 
was that they did not believe exactly as the church wanted them to believe. We're talking about the Moors. See, this whole concept of not believing what, were them trying to get the Africans to take on Christianity, something that the Moors never did to the Christians, by the way. Uh, they were tortured with instruments invented by the perverted ingenuity of man to produce the most excruciating pain and torment. These tortures, con these tortures consisted of the breaking of the victim's bone upon the wheel and rack, you know, that thing that stretched you, the application of the thumb screw and the leg crusher, the branding of the flesh with red hot irons, the tearing of the body with pincers of steel, Eyes were blinded, fingers cut off, and tongues ripped out. Some were submerged in waters, others were beaten and racked beyond recognition. All this was done to make them confess to the crime of heresy, which, by the way, is the precursor to burning women at the stake, witch hunting. That is, to the unbelief in the religion of those who were torturing them, that they might be taken to the public square and roasted to death. During the period of the Inquisition, nearly 300 years, it has been reliably estimated that more than one million victims, and I'll add the word Moors, were roasted to death, tortured, and killed. One of my purposes in, re in traveling through Europe was to gather together as many, pos as many as possible of the instruments of torture that were used during the Inquisition and establish in the United States a museum of these religious articles that may serve as an object lesson to man, that he should bear charitably and tolerantly with his fellow man upon the question of religion, and that such a hateful institution as the Inquisition shall never again exist upon this earth. Mm -hmm. This is white supremacy. This that we just talked about is what we went through here in America. Maybe, what, maybe you could, I just want you to segue that into after the Inquisition, Portugal, which was already in Africa, but the slave trade begins, and it is the same army on a war footing, or these same people on a war footing, who comes to Africa. I want you to kind of give us your insight and understanding to okay. these two cultures clashing okay. and how they would have ultimately ended up with us being finale. Well, f fundamentally what you have is what Francis Cress Wilson calls genetic annihilation. They understand that the clock is ticking. Even in 1492, they understood this. And they understood that if they allowed the Moors to continue to be in power, that in fact they would physically, mentally, and spiritually be taken off of the planet. Mm -hmm. And that their birth would never occur again unless Africans moved into the Ice Age. That's the first thing that they understood. They understood that they did not have the wherewithal to be able to survive and to create a civilization. So they, like parasites, like fleas, attached themselves to the host, sucking the nature of the host from it. What occurred, as always occurs, the only way that Castile and Aragon could defeat the Moors was the same reason why they could not defeat them before. Because the Moors were organized and Castile and Aragon were mortal enemies. When Castile and Aragon, Ferdinand and Isabella only got married to unite the two kingdoms, east and west, to go after the Moors and chase them out. The Moors fought amongst themselves. As an African people, in my research of us as a people, before you see our destruction in whatever phase, whether it be Egypt, whether it be the Moors, whether it be us in America, even to this very day, if you see our destruction, if you take two steps back, we're fighting amongst ourselves. They don't have the power and the ability to do what they have to do. They must depend on us fighting each other, which weakens both of our factions, and they come together whether they like it or not. They hate each other, but they understand the need to come together as one to, and then to separate us into two so that their one is in fact a majority over our two, although our two combined dwarfs them in terms of numbers. But with us split apart, they can do battle with both factions because we both have two enemies. We have them and us. They only have one enemy, and that's us collective. But they got help. They got allies on both sides because we helping them and our, uh, and our brothers and sisters are helping them by us fighting each other. If we got to the point 
where no matter what we felt towards each other, that we had unconditional love for a nation to be built, we would be free yesterday. It is only the Willie Lynch syndrome, as Minister Louis Farrakhan points out, that keeps us in the position that we're in. Because once we come together, it's over. Now, they come after the Inquisition. Yes. They come down into Africa. Well, the Inquisition is going on. The Inquisition is going on simultaneously. And what's also happening during the Inquisition is that they are moving Moors off of the land. See, this is another thing that we have to be aware of in terms of our history. Many of the original people coming to this part of the world were Moors, particularly those in the Spanish-speaking islands. Many of, in fact, in Puerto Rico, they have a celebration during the third week of July that they call the celebration. Well, they have three, but in July, it's, called, uh, it's uh, dedicated to uh, Juan the Apostol, um, uh, John the Apostle. And basically, uh, they celebrate Vejigante, Vejigante is the more, but syncretism is like Santeria. Syn syncretism is like when we mask our true feelings, but we celebrate a white thing. It's like when you look at Santeria, it is based in the Christian faith, but it has African undertones to it. Mm -hmm. Well, the same is true when you come to this part of the world and the Vejigante. The Vejigante is supposed to be the more who goes around to the town and scares the children and the people. But the real thing was that the, Moor, the Moors weren't the ones going around scaring the people. It was a European that went around scaring the people. But for Africans to celebrate that in Puerto Rico, they could not make the European the evil one. So they made themselves the evil one. But they really were the metaphor for the white man. That's why they, fa they paint their fi face white. Mm -hmm. And they paint their face in different flavor so that it creates a syncretism. It's a hidden message underneath what they're actually saying. So there's evidence of the Moors in the Caribbean, in their celebrations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly in Puerto Rico, but it also is in the Spanish-speaking island. The first Moors were, in fact, the ones exiled off their land and brought to the Caribbean. That was part of the Inquisition, along with stealing all of the gold and all of the buildings and all of the other things that belonged. They weren't really trying to make people into Christians because they just wanted to kill these black people. They just used religion mm -hmm. because a lot of the Moors were already Christians. There were Moorish Christians here, too. Moor doesn't mean you're a Muslim. Moor is an African. It means you're black. But there were Moorish Christians, there were Moorish Jews, and there were Moorish Muslims. Of course, the great majority were Muslims. But during the Inquisition, they steal the land, which gives the, the, the monetary ability for Columbus to get on the waters, and for Spain to come to this part of the world, and for Portugal to come to this part of the world. See, that the money they used was coming out of the Inquisition. They were going to steal it anyway. Whether you became a Muslim, a Christian or not, they were going to kill you and take your stuff. They just used religion as that peace. You know, like the martyrs. The book points out there were, there were no martyrs. In fact, the Moors used to tell the Christians, look, we don't want to kill you. The Christians, some of them committed suicide, and other Christians said that the Muslims had killed them and made them into martyrs. Where does the word martyr come from? Anytime you see mur, mar, any of that, it comes from the Moors. The, re the first martyrs in Europe were the mur Moors. The word martyr comes out of Moor. But see, they don't say this. You know, when you have uh, uh, Joan of Arc and all of these other martyrs, people who died. Well, the first three martyrs of the Christian church were African. The first martyrs of the church were Africans. The first Christian church was African. So it is not far from the fact that martyr became more. So there's no problem in seeing the relationship linguistically to martyr and more. And it's important that the, the monies that were taken from the Inquisition that led to exploration, what occurred in Europe was, well, let me put it to you this way. The ancestors to multinational corporations are the pirates. Remember, the governments give charters to businesses mm -hmm. that come and do all their work. The governments didn't do that. The businesses did that. Slavery was a business. It wasn't a political entity. It served political purposes, but it wasn't a political entity. These were businesses. When you're dealing with these pirates, um, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and all these people, these, these are the ancestors of big business. These are the ones that start channel. This is where they get their money from in terms of 
Because what Europe is looking for is drugs. They're looking for sugar. Drugs. Sugar. Sugar was the first drug. Europeans got hooked on sugar. Moors brought sugar into Europe. So what happened was, because you see, you can't grow sugar in Europe because sugar needs a tropical climate. Okay. Sugar cane, you see? So what is happening is that sugar and sweets are being brought here. These Europeans never ate this before. They never had food that we, they had the spices and things for the food. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that they get hooked on sugar, but they can't get enough of it. So they decide to go, see, cotton didn't get us in trouble. Sugar did. That's the first product of the slave trade, was sugar. Mm -hmm. So what happens is a lively trade occurs here. But The, the key to remember here is that the agricultural ma'afa, enslavement period, or, or, or life down here, built astronomically the industries and factories of the north, mm -hmm. free labor. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that in an industrial revolution, for instance, when you begin, what, what might have taken you an hour to make one pair of shoes, you now can make 300 pairs of shoes. Let's just right. throw that out. Even if it was five. What's happening is that industry is growing at geometric progression while capitalism grows ar arithmetically. In other words, arithmetic means one, two, three, four, five. Geometric means two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, mm -hmm. down the line. What was happening was that agriculture was slowing up industry. And the North said to the South, we are in an industrial mode, which means that in an industrial mode, we have to create a capitalism. Everybody has to be able to vie for the top. There has to be very strong competition in order for it to, we'll strangle ourselves, we'll, we'll drown in our own uh, situation if we don't expand. The holding of African people must stop. See, they did not see where this was heading. They had no conceptualization of being able to do 200 shoes in a way that you would only have been able to have the time to do one. So they didn't see this happening, so therefore when it came, it surprised them, and they began to choke. So what they said is that you all have to stop this enslavement. You can't have slavery because if you have free labor, the whites, the poor whites, will not have an incentive to move up because people in business will have free labor. So why pay somebody when you can have it done free? Okay? The South said to the North, look, it's because of us that you even have that, so you need to be quiet. See, the South could have lived on its own. The North couldn't. The, the North needed agriculture. Agriculture didn't need industry because they still could do what they needed to do down South. But down North, if you don't have the product, you can't make the thing. If you have the product, you might just do it, but you do it slower. So the South had the advantage, and they knew it. And they said, no, we're not going to get rid of our enslavement. That's what made us who we are. You're asking us to do something. You had slaves just up until a couple of years ago. You only cut it loose because you're industrial now. Mm -hmm. But you don't like them any more than we do. And they said, no, we don't like them any more than, than you do, but that's not the point. For industry to be able to survive, you've got to stop slavery. That is a principle in capitalism. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to have the momentum. They said, well, what are we going to do? By the way, welfare was one of the answers to what they did. But they said, well, what we're going to do is that we're just going to free African people. And the South said, no, you're not going to free them. North said, yes, you are. South said, no, we aren't. North said, yes, you are. South said, we're going to secede. North said, no, you're not. South said, yes, we are. North said, let's go to war. That's the Civil War. It had nothing to do with freeing us. They, they didn't have any love for us to free us. They freed us because industry couldn't have existed with slavery in place. I'm not quite sure that I understand that. Uh, are you talking about people wouldn't buy the products? And then they, they would be making a lot of products and couldn't sell them. Why couldn't they sell them to Europe, to England, and uh, create other markets, other places? Because the, the, the fuel of, in, of the Industrial Revolution itself was the individual competing with other individuals. Mm -hmm. That's the image of the philosophy of capitalism. It's dog-eat-dog. Dog. And everybody's climbing up to that 
apex of the pyramid. That's capitalism. Mm -hmm. It allows anybody to be able to rise up in the society if you have the right ideas. Mm -hmm. Slavery or the enslavement of a human being, like what's happening in America today. Mm -hmm. They're going to foreign places because they can get cheaper labor than they can get here. Right. Mm -hmm. If you could get free labor, even Hong Kong would be too expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it breaks down capitalism. That's what's happening here in America. What's happening now is that there are corporations that are willing to let America fall because they're on an international level now. Mm -hmm. They can survive because they're international now. Before, they were just locally involved in this hemisphere. The world has become their employment opportunity now. But in a capitalist system, you cannot have free labor. You have to have the concept of competition. Mm -hmm. Someone is not going to hire somebody. Like, for instance, if you have a farm and you say to your workers, if you know you can sell, let's say, 200 ears of corn for a great price, you'll say, the first person that brings me 200 ears of corn is going to get a bonus. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you say to somebody, whether or not you pull this, you're not going to get nothing extra, the incentive to be quick isn't there. Right. As a slave state, if you are in a position of working for free, there is no momentum for you to compete. Mm -hmm. Therefore, everything is going to keep going this way while industry is moving very quickly, but you're still moving this way. Mm -hmm. It will suffocate industry and there will be an implosion in the civilization. Mm -hmm. The first evidence of that implosion was the stock market crash. Mm -hmm. You see, now again, look at the history that we've come. We've come from Egypt to Greece to Rome to the Catholic Church to the barbarians of the Visigoths, to the Moors, to Columbus, to the Caribbean, to America, to big business, to the American Revolution, to the Civil War, to Reconstruction, to the Civil Rights Movement, to where we are today. Mm -hmm. And it can be traced back, and in history, this is why Professor Clark said that history was the clock that people used to tell their uh, political time of day, and it was a compass that they found themselves on the map of human geography, because history will ground you. And you can see yourself, and if you can see what got you into this position, you can see what can get you out. Because all you have to do is go back to the last step where you stepped off of Ma'at, and the first step is to unite together. Mm -hmm. In closing, Brother Booker T, in the few minutes that we have, um, we talked on the way down about sun and agriculture and the study of the sun having to do with a way out. Yes. We need a way out. Absolutely. Maybe absolutely. Just close with that. I'd, I'd, I'd close I'd, on a high note. Absolutely. Right? Well, you know, the high note is here. Uh, freedom is not at hand, it is, is not in hand, it is a process. Uh, I'm very optimistic about our future, but I'm very realistic about what we face towards that future. I'm not looking all gloriously and seeing great things. We have, as Dr. King said, we have difficult days ahead, but what, what, what the centerpiece to civilization, and I go back to a book called Hyperspace by a Japanese brother by the name of Michio Kaku who, is, who, who, who has a radio program on WBAI and he also is, I believe, a professor at City College of New York. To use part of his work that he writes in hyperspace, he breaks civilizations down into four parts. And he says that civilization is based on where you receive your energy. In other words, energy gives a civilization the ability to build a technology. Whether it be a pyramid technology, a temple technology, a computer technology, whatever it is, it relies on the energy source. So he says that a zero, grab, a zero civilization is a civilization who gets its energy from the earth, water, air or wind, um, uh, batteries, everything is earth, petroleum, which is oil in the ground, fossil fuels. He says that a type one civilization is a civilization that derives its power from the sun. Therefore, things that motiv motivate your society, in other words, type two. I'm sorry? Type two from the sun? Uh, no, type one. Okay. Type zero is earth, okay. type one is sun. All right. Because he believes zero, and I believe zero is just the beginnings. It would be to the Dogon called Jiriso, the word on the front. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, it's just that basic earth. You're drawing your power, your energy from the earth. The type 1 civilization draws it from the sun, so therefore, if you have a solar dish where you can get your light, your heat, your computer run, your, your television cameras, your televisions, whatever it is, runs on solar, then you have an inexhaustible source of energy that you can fuel your life by this energy, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually too. You will become a sun person. Okay, so we're not just talking about the physical manifestations, but the mental and spiritual manifestations of this same energy. Because we all are, by the way, pieces of the sun encapsulated in this temple. The type 2 civilization, after you got aware of the earth, you became so aware of the earth, you then tapped into the sun, our sun, Ra. Then, after tapping into the sun, our sun becomes like a satellite. Just like when you want to watch a show in, let's say, Africa. You don't have a beam that can take you directly to Africa, so you have a satellite. A satellite that will send a message from where you are to the satellite, and then the satellite down to where you're going on the Earth. Even if you're going on the other side of the Earth, you need to send that message to another satellite that will then send it to that part of the Earth. But a satellite will do it. The Chemites believed, ancient civilizations believed, that you could use the sun as a similar satellite. That, in fact, the Type II civilization was where you derived your power from the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. In other words, you use the sun as a satellite to draw other powers from the billions and billions of stars of our entire Milky Way galaxy. Imagine that kind of energy that you could have. For me, the evidence of that power rests in the sarcophagi of King Tut, that in fact Africans were on a type two, or a type two civilization by some of the pictographs of the relationship of stars to human beings. There's, it's obvious that they knew something. Also, the Dogon clearly talk about a galactic power that they were able to derive. But now the final type of civilization, a type three, remembering the satellitic kind of power, is that the Earth and the human uses itself as the energy. Then the type one is the human uses itself to get the solar power. Then the type two civilization is that the human uses the sun, and the sun is the satellite that draws galactic power from billions.